speaker was actually supposed to be our first speaker, but was unfortunately delayed. But we are very glad to have him with us now. Mr. Eric Cohen is the editor and founder of The New Atlantis, a quarterly journal on the ethics and politics of science and technology. He is the resident scholar and director on the program on bioethics and American democracy at the Ethics and Public Policy Center in Washington. He is a senior advisor to the President's Council on Bioethics, and his essays and articles have appeared in such places as the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the LA Times, USA Today, the Weekly Standard, Public Interest, the Hastings Center Report, and more. He is the co-editor of The Future Is Now, America Confronts New, America Confronts New Genetics, and that is available in the lobby. And we invite him now to speak to us on To Cure and To Care, The Dilemma of Old Age. Please join me in welcoming Eric Cohen. Palsying every limb, 
And so faculty after faculty quits us, and where then is life? Yet in Jefferson's time, most people never reached this extended period of debility, because, because they died suddenly in the nursery of life or at the peak of their flourishing. Living to old age was the dream of the vulnerable many. Living with old age was the problem of the fortunate few. In developed societies today, by contrast, old age is the norm. Average life expectancy in the United States is now 78 years and rising, up from 47 in 1900. And those over age 85 are already the fastest growing segment of the population. People are not only living longer, they are staying healthier well into their 60s, 70s, and 80s, and they expect to enjoy many years of vigorous retirement. On balance, it is a wonderful time to be old, and the democratization and expansion of old age are among modernity's greatest achievements. Yet the coming of the mass geriatric society is also a source of tremendous anxiety. Americans worry about the soaring costs of Social Security and Medicare, the collapse of private pensions, the shortage of good nursing homes, and the potential clash between the young and the old over resources and priorities. Our deepest worries, however, are personal. We dread spending our final years in a degraded state, resented by caregivers or abandoned by loved ones, of little use to ourselves, never mind to others. Such worries are not unjustified. Although most Americans can expect to live healthily well past 65, many will also live long enough to endure a prolonged period of frailty. According to a recent RAND study, roughly 40% of deaths in the United States are now preceded by a period of enfeeblement, debility, and often dementia lasting up to a decade. Prominent are those suffering from Alzheimer's disease, a condition that steadily destroys the mind and body, strips individuals of self-awareness and self-control, and often requires that they spend their final years in an institution incapable of feeding or bathing themselves. Today, over four million Americans suffer from Alzheimer's. By mid-century, that number is expected to rise to over 13 million, all of them requiring many years of expensive, expensive, and exhausting full-time care. Yet precisely as the need is rising, the pool of available family caregivers is dwindling. Families are smaller, less stable, and more geographically spread out. Most women are now employed outside the home. The well-to-do can afford to hire professionals, but there are already shortages of geriatricians and nurses. Those jobs requiring great humanity but offering little paid reward, like feeding Alzheimer's patients or changing bedpans, are greatly undersubscribed. All this creates a perfect social storm. As the number of retired baby boomers expands, they will seek to augment existing social programs for the elderly, creating novel fiscal challenges for Medicare and Medicaid. Politically, long-term care benefits might become the sequel to prescription drug benefits, and far costlier. At the same time, the personal burdens of caring for needy elders will test the strength of already fragile modern families. Those in middle age may wonder about the wisdom or duty of sacrificing so much for so long on behalf of lives that seem so diminished. And they may come to believe that death of the elderly is preferable to life in what seems like such a miserable condition. In the face of such burdens, two, quote, solutions appeal today to different strains of American pragmatism. Both are seductive, and both in instructive ways are deeply misguided. The first so-called solution is the gospel of healthy aging. In its triumphalist vision, things for older Americans are always getting better, as a top official at Medicare recently put it. Nearly everyone in public life embraces this faith in the saving powers of medical progress. Although conservatives tend to emphasize drug development and free market medicine, while liberals tend to emphasize embryonic stem cell research and treat cheap drugs from Canada. To be sure, the twin goals of attacking ability and caring for the debilitated are not intrinsically or necessarily opposed to each other. But it is also foolish to act and speak as if medical progress will liberate us from the realities of decline, debility, and death, or from the unavoidable duties of caregiving at the end of life. First, medical progress often leads to greater debility in later years, even as, and precisely because, it cures deadly diseases in earlier ages, at earlier ages. This is the paradox of modern aging. We are vigorous longer, but we are also incapacitated longer. 
Obviously, no one wants to turn back the clock to a time when mothers and children died regularly in childbirth, when infectious diseases decimated helpless communities, when heart disease was largely undiagnosed and untreated, and when a diagnosis of cancer meant swift and certain death. That severing medicine's sweetest fruits from its sourest consequences may prove impossible. Second, to see medical progress as a, quote, cost saver is simplistic at best. Medical care is more expensive than ever precisely because we can do so much more to diagnose and treat disease. And Medicare and Medicaid are costlier than ever because more people are living longer. Even if curing today's diseases becomes less expensive over time, no one knows the cost of dealing with the diseases that will replace them. Only if people live free of illness to the very end and then die suddenly will medical progress really result in cheaper medicine. Otherwise, it will continue to purchase greater longevity and better health at an increased overall expense. Finally, and more deeply, there is something weird about treating old age as a time of life when things should always be, quote, getting better. While aging affords some people new possibilities for learning and growth, it also means, eventually and inevitably, the loss of one's vital powers. Some people may ride horses or climb mountains into their 70s and 80s, just like in the commercials for anti-arthritis medication. But such idealized images offer a partial and misleading picture of the realities of senescence, that series of small dyings on the way to death. Endless chatter about healthy aging is at bottom a form of denial. Ultimately, the nursing home refutes the dream of limitless progress toward ageless bodies, and America will surely be building many more nursing homes in the years ahead. None of this is meant to imply ingratitude for the blessings of medical progress, including current research aimed at curing age-related diseases like Alzheimer's. But in fueling our love of youthfulness and limitless life, and our hatred of senescence and decline, the campaign for healthy aging also subtly encourages us to devalue the need to give care and comfort to those we cannot cure. When, moreover, aging does not bring only the good tidings we were promised, we may seek instead an ever more absolute control over death and come to embrace the pseudo-mastery of death on demand as the cure for our unconquerable miseries. The goals of mastery and control in the face of death also lie behind the second prominent false solution to the dilemmas of aging debility, the legal gospel of the living will. During the national drama over Terry Schiavo, the real problem in the eyes of many was that her wishes were never put clearly in writing. The moral lesson was that everyone should prepare a living will, saying exactly what should be done if and when incapacity strikes. At first glance, the case for living will seems compelling, especially in a nation that places such a high value on individual autonomy. Living wills extend our irrevocable right to speak for ourselves, even when our powers of speech and reason are gone. They honor our preferences regarding, preferences regarding how we wish to die by allowing us to dictate all future medical interventions. They protect debilitated patients from having other people's wishes imposed on them, whether in the form of overtreatment or undertreatment. They give family members explicit permission to fight on or let go, especially in medically ambiguous situations where they might otherwise be incapable of making morally wrenching decisions about life and death. And they protect financial resources from being squandered whether on heroic interventions made in crisis or on seemingly endless long-term care. But after three decades, there is increasing evidence that living wills have failed to meet these practical objectives. Most people do not have living wills, despite a very long active campaign to promote them. And even those who do complete living wills often do not express clear pre treatment preferences or unable to comprehend the clinical conditions they might face in the future they leave vague instructions or change their preferences depending on how a given medical situation is described. Most people simply cannot imagine a debilitated future and a healthy present, and they do not want to think about frailty and dependence at the height of their flourishing or even in the early days of their decline. Moreover, when life's, finally chapter, when life's final chapter does come, no legal instructions written in advance, no matter how perfect, can replace the need for loving and devoted caregivers. Inasmuch as the gospel of the living will denies this truth, it perpetuates an illusion of perfect independence, isolating individuals at the very moment when they need others most of all. And this brings me to the core subject of my talk, 
the looming crisis of caregiving in a cure-seeking society, and the reality of dependence in a culture that prizes self-reliance above all. This crisis of caregiving has two phases, a crisis in medicine and a crisis in the family. One of the ironies of medical progress is that we stand in greatest need of family doctors and general practitioners, just as medical super-specialization has turned them into endangered species. Especially for the frail elderly, comprehensive and continuous care is virtually impossible to obtain. One doctor treats our failing hearts, another our wheezy lungs, a third our sluggish bowels, a fourth our tired blood, and a fifth our fraying nerves, but often no physician is willing or able to look after us. In elder care, and especially in nursing homes, burnout is common and high turnover rates prevent continuity of care, not only from doctors, but also from nurses and social workers. If trustworthy and dependable long-term care is to be had, only the steadfast efforts of devoted family members can secure it, or in many instances, provide it themselves. Yet in an aging society, we stand in greatest need of families, just as family life has been most weakened. There are the well-known and widespread phenomena of divorce and family rupture, lower birth rates, geographical mobility, and the weakened social importance of extended family. Moreover, many of today's old people and many aging baby boomers never had children, and many more have little claim on their children's loyalty. When a neglectful parent needs care from the children he neglected, the sins of the absent father or rejecting mother are often repaid in kind. But even in the best of intact families, the picture is sobering. When a husband or wife acquires Alzheimer's disease or some other progressive disability, the front line of care is generally manned by the spouse if he or she is healthy enough for the task. Fidelity between spouses, displayed most poignantly when the marriage bed becomes a nursing station, is anticipated in a wedding vow wherein husband and wife pledge their mutual devotion for better and for worse. However invisible to them when they chose to marry, caregiving at the end of life is part of the marital vocation, and many a husband and wife rises to the occasion with strength and dignity. Eventually, however, even the most blessed and long-lived marriages produce a widower and widower, and then the prospects for faithful long-term care become truly uncertain. Studies indicate that only someone with three or more daughters or daughters-in-law can reasonably expect to escape institutionalization for long-term care. This is not the consequence of mere filial ingratitude or heartless indifference. For in truth, it is very strange for a whole society of adult children to be summoned to care on a long-term basis for those who once cared for them. In contrast to caring for the young, the care of the elderly by their grown children is unrewarded by the joyful experience of seeing a new life unfold and flourish. Even in the best cases, when children gladly discharge their obligation to honor thy father and mother, there is unavoidable sadness and indignity. As the Yiddish proverb has it, when the father helps the son, both laugh. When the son helps the father, both cry. No child wants to uncover the nakedness of his father or mother, and no mother or father wants to stand incompetent before the children. More fundamentally, there is also a disruption of the naturally forward-looking thrust of intergenerational life. The burdens of caring for one's parents and of being cared for by one's children risk obscuring the stake that both the old and the middle aged have in the rising third generation. For a grown child best repays the gifts of his parents by raising children of his own, and grandparents have a greater interest in seeing grandchildren flourish than in maximizing the comfort of their own last days. In these complicated circumstances, Trying to discern what is required by intergenerational fidelity can give rise to anguishing dilemmas. A daughter raising young children of her own might see the pneumonia afflicting her father, who already suffers from advanced Alzheimer's, as nature's way of restoring the generational balance, to be accepted with sorrow rather than opposed with penicillin. Or conversely, the same daughter might wish to demonstrate to her own children what it signifies to love another in his greatest need, and what it means to appreciate the blessings of health in the face of the miseries of disease. Many people experience caring for aged parents as a vocation, a duty lovingly fulfilled, giving life its true meaning. But many others experience it as a curse, a duty grudgingly accepted or not, robbing life of its true pleasures. 
In some cases, the demands of caring for the elderly reveal the family at its best, faithful to the end. In others, the very presence of the helpless elderly suffocates everything else in family life. Yet what would family become, we must ask, if the old were abandoned in the name of the young, or the weak left to die in the name of the flourishing? In the years ahead, the greatest dilemmas will confront the middle-aged members of the middle class. Those who are wealthy enough to have choices, like hiring professional caregivers, yet limited enough to make every choice a real sacrifice, like having to forgo extra income to stay at home with an aging mother, or depleting retirement savings to pay for a father's assisted living. Compelled to make such choices, even the most devoted may feel both resentment and guilt. Resentment of what they must give up, guilt that they may not have done enough. Inevitably, the questions will arise, are these sacrifices worth it? Are we really helping Dad by extending a life that seems so diminished? Is his life still even worth living? And here we come to the sharpest kind of ethical dilemmas and debates. When it comes to human life and human care, most Americans are committed, at least in the abstract, to the view that all human beings are created equal. And since the days of Hippocrates, physicians for their part have eschewed judging the worth of the lives they treat and have refused to give a deadly drug if asked or even to make a suggestion to that effect. Never are the disabled deemed unworthy of medical or humane care. On the contrary, their need for care is precisely the reason we are, we are obliged to provide it. But as we saw in the Shibo debate, this general agreement regarding equal human worth can disappear in certain Although many continue to believe that every human life, regardless of debility, possesses equal dignity, others now argue openly that equal treatment for all is best advanced by not diverting precious resources to the severely disabled. And still others believe that the indignities of old age, especially dementia, belie all sanctimonious talk of equal worth or equal dignity. Among these people are the advocates of euthanasia or mercy care. For the time being, America seems immune to embracing this particular solution for the burdens of the aging society. Even in those states, like California and Vermont, that have considered joining Oregon and legalizing assisted suicide, the justification is personal choice, not a category of human beings officially defined by hospitals or by the state as life unworthy of living or better off dead. At the same time, however, more and more commentators are deploring the amount of money spent on medical care for people near the end of life. As the American population ages, we can expect to hear even more talk of people with, quote, low quality of life, unworthy of the resources that are, quote, wasted on them. What begins today as a campaign to give individuals a right to ease themselves out of life can easily turn into a campaign to get the enfeebled and demented to exercise their right to die, or since they are unable to do the deadly deed themselves, to exercise it for them. Against this danger, the assertion that life is sacred and should always be sustained will prove an insufficient defense. Indeed, even those who pledge their belief in the sanctity of every human being will often wonder whether intervening medically really benefits the life they hold to be so precious. Is it love or is it cruelty to cure the pneumonia in an elderly person suffering from a painful form of terminal cancer? especially a person so demented that the mitigating comforts of family and friendship cannot be appreciated? Is it love or is it cruelty to extend a life marked by incontinence of bladder and bowel, uncontrollable outbursts of rage, and the psychophysical misery caused by Alzheimer's? Is it love or is it cruelty to force a patient with mild dementia to continue kidney dialysis that he vigorously resists, knowing that he cannot understand either how the dialysis can help him or that ceasing treatment will bring him to death. Faced with these painful choices, and in moments of weakness, hastening death's arisal may seem like the compassionate thing to do. Traditional medical ethics, ever mindful of this temptation, has been very clear about the duty to resist it, never to kill, always to care. If doctors and others are faithfully to benefit the life the patient still has, they cannot sit in ultimate judgment of its worth, and cannot ever think that lethal intervention is an acceptable therapeutic option. This holds true even for those non-demented patients who knowingly ask doctors or family members to help them die, whether in the present because they are suffering now, or in the future because they cannot bear the thought of living with dementia. 
But traditional medical ethics has also long taught that benefiting the life a debilitated person still has does not mean taking every possible medical action to extend it. Senescence leads inevitably to death, medicine or no medicine. And so while active killing may be incompatible with true caregiving, letting die is always a part of caregiving. In this reasoning, life-sustaining treatment may be, and often should be, forgone or terminated if the interventions themselves impose undue burdens on the patient or interfere with the comfortable death of someone who is already irretrievably dying. Guidance in this area comes from distinguishing between the burdens of a treatment imposed by caregivers and for which they are thus responsible, and the burdens of living with a terrible disease imposed by nature and for which they are not ultimately responsible. Yet as we enter the mass geriatric society, it is clear that our new technological capacities are putting pressure on even these sensible distinctions. A century ago, Dr. William Osler could write, quote, pneumonia may well be called the friend of the aged. Taken off by it in an acute, short, not often painful illness, the old man escapes these cold gradations of decay so, de so distressing to himself and to his friends. But today, thanks to antibiotics, the aged have no natural friends, or few that are not more commonly regarded as enemies. Life-sustaining interventions, if effective and not especially burdensome, have come to be regarded as standard care and morally obligatory. As a result, well-meaning and morally sound decisions to treat intervening illnesses, like curing a father's urinary infection despite his living will, can make us complicit in the continuing miseries and degradations of those we love. Here, then, is the most poignant dilemma faced by caregivers. Not wishing to condemn the worth of people's lives, yet not wanting to bind them to the rack of their growing misery. Not wishing to say they are better off dead, yet not wanting to always oppose their going hither. Under these circumstances, with no simple formulas for finding the best course of action, individuals and families must find their way, case by case and moment to moment, often with only unattractive options to choose from, and knowing that whatever path they choose, they will feel the heavy weight of the path not chosen. The ethical obligation to care well is hard enough for those with the best health care available. It will be a true trial of the spirit for individuals who lack such access, and for a society that must eventually control the rising cost of entitlements, just as the demand for elder care grows exponentially. In the days ahead, Americans will need to make hard choices among competing goods and to confront the limits of even our own affluent society. But even then, the biggest challenges before us will not be economic in nature, but cultural and spiritual. How to deepen our understanding of what it means to age and die. How to combat the overly medicalized view of old age that now dominates our attitudes and our institutions. And how to recover the wisdom contained in the human life cycle. This is why the theme of this year's conference is so welcome. Americans increasingly regard old age as a bundle of needs and problems demanding solution or as a time of life whose meaning is defined largely by the struggle to stay healthy and fit. This outlook has generated discontent with the life cycle itself, producing an insatiable desire for more and more medical miracles and creating a fantasy that we can transcend our limitations or that death itself may be pushed back indefinitely. More deeply, the same outlook has engendered the illusion that independence is the whole truth about our lives causing us to undervalue those attachments and obligations that bind and complete us. We live already in a world in which the life cycle has largely lost its ethical meaning. Aware as we may be that we are on a solitary journey that ends inevitably in the grave, few of us take our bearings from nature's eternal teaching that there is a time to be born and a time to die. We learn little from the rhythm of growth and decay, everything in its season, our own finitude transcended and redeemed by generation upon generation of new birth and renewal, transforming each singular finite trajectory into a permanently recurring cycle of life. This cultural myopia is no trivial matter. Indeed, in the mass geriatric society, it could have deadly consequences. For unless we learn to accept both our frailties and our finitude, we are likely to find the burdens of caregiving intolerable. Unless we learn how to let loved ones die when the time comes, we will be tempted to kill, self-righteously, of course, in the guise of a false compassion. 
Sooner or later, when the medical gospel of healthy aging and the legal gospel of living wills are shown to have been false teachings, we may easily fall prey to the utilitarian gospel of euthanasia, whose prophets are patiently waiting in the wings for their time upon our cultural stage. And paradoxically, the dogmatic insistence that patients must be kept alive regardless of the depth of their disabilities, that severe dementia or unmanageable suffering deserves no consideration in deciding when to let nature take its course, may only make mercy killing appear to be the more compassionate remedy for the miseries of extended decline. In the end, there is no solution to the problems of old age, at least no solution that any civilized society could tolerate. But there are better and worse ways to see our aging condition. The better way begins in thinking of ourselves less as wholly autonomous individuals than as members of families, in relinquishing our mistaken belief that medicine can miraculously liberate our loved ones or ourselves from debility and decline, and in abjuring the fantasy that we can control the manner and the hour of our dying. We need to learn instead to accept death in its proper season as mortal beings replaced and renewed by the generations that follow. So uh, 
it's a long answer to a deep question, but the point of it is that uh, obviously we need to confront our mortality, but I think the wisdom of the life cycle has something to do with seeing the connection between death and birth, between accepting our own time to die and welcoming a new generation. Um, and I think those two human themes are never really bound together. And we're going to see that reality when we get to the carrier of the crisis, as I try to describe it, because uh, those baby boomers who didn't have a lot of children who were, or involved in complicated divorces and where family royalties and devotions have been uh, muddied, shall we say, um, who's going to stand there and be their caregivers? Um, and that's a question that's going to loom very large, I think, in the years yet. So it's a very deep question. I don't know that we can get to the bottom of it, but uh, it's, a welcome, it's a welcome question. Should I just alternate sides here? Or? Are you poised to attack me or are you just going to? Oh, no. <laughs> uh, just for clarification, um, your point, what, or the point is to allow ourselves to learn to die with dignity when our time comes instead of trying to unnaturally prolong ourselves to, to the point of burden. I think that's the, the aim. Yeah, I, I think there are two kinds of dangers here. On the one hand is the sort of zealous desire to live forever, um, where that becomes the only moral imperative and where everything else is set aside in the name of extending life and ending suffering. Um, extending life and ending suffering are very high moral imperatives and very great human goods, but they're not the highest of the only human goods. Um, we don't you know, uh, take the organs of the living in order to save six people who are dying. Um, and so there's the danger of, of seeking a kind of false mortality um, and seeking a kind of control of one's body and its demise through science. Um, to some degree, this is virtuous, but at a point at risk of becoming unvirtuous. At the same time, there's a kind of contrary, uh, the parallel danger, which is the danger of euthanasia and assisted suicide. Um, and one would say, well, that seems like accepting death. That seems like the very opposite. Well, in some sense, I think that's true. But at the same time, it's the kind of mirror image of control, right? Uh, part of accepting death years ahead is going to involve accepting decline. And what euthanasia tries to offer is control in the face of decline. So death, willed death, becomes um, a kind of solution to the problems of ability. And I think within those two extremes, we're trying to find a morally sensible middle, um, which is how to care for those um, who are aging and dying, how to see them on the one hand as equal members of the human community, worthy of care, never defined as life unworthy of living, but at the same time recognizing that there is a kind of there is a time to die, and there is a rhythm to human existence for those who are blessed enough to live a long life. And we're going to have to face those burdens and make the wisest, best decisions we make, knowing always that we're going to feel the weight of, of what we decide to do, the weight of extending a life that is in the midst of terrible suffering, or the weight of letting someone die, um, knowing that you might have extended their life a few more days or a few more weeks or even a few more months. And I think that's the, the moral dilemma that we face on top of the grave kind of sociological dilemmas that are looming in terms of paying for Social Security and Medicare, or trying to get the resources that people need in order to be good caregivers, but recognizing that caring for the elderly is not the only civic responsibility that we have, and we, we have other kinds of moral obligations that as a society we provide for. So it's not a cheerful subject, but uh, hopefully some virtue can help with it. Thank Thanks you. for your question. Yeah, I'm just going to talk about texting and you were saying your mind was much more. It's just like, you seem like you're saying that, you know, growing old is just a natural thing and you should go with that and not try and do as much of the mental aspects to put a long life unnecessarily. But when do you make that distinction saying, you know, like, put it long and like, you're too old, go off and do with it while we care for someone younger than you? I mean, how do you make that decision to where it's unnecessarily prolonging their life and not actually giving them, you know, the extra years that you can add on top of it. Yeah, that's a, that's a good, again, hard question. I think it's a hard one. Um, I, I don't think we should ever say when people hit a certain age, thanks but no thanks, you know, we're going to use these resources to, you know, pay for nursery school or something like that. Um, <laughs> but nature is both wise and horrible. I mean, uh, there's a wisdom to the life cycle. 
has risen to the natural ascendant decline of human beings. But at the same time, modern medicine exists precisely to use nature in order to impose nature. Um, and I'm a great defender, you know, two and a half cheers for modern medicine. Um, but the problem we face is now that we've invented all kinds of ways of intervening and extending life, uh, the question is, when does what is possible become a moral imperative? Um, and on the one hand, as I try to argue in the paper, we don't want to define anyone as unworthy of care. We don't want to define anyone as a life not worth treating. At the same time, we don't want to be torturers. I mean, we don't want to extend um, a life wrapped by misery. Um, and there's a kind of genuine dilemma here. Um, I think the best we can do is set some kind of moral boundary, some, some, some lines that we never cross. I think the most important and most obvious line is we never take measures to actively kill a patient. You know, we never become the, the lethal agents of their death. And I think there's an important distinction to be made between active killing and letting die. At the same time, we have criteria that say, what are the grounds for foregoing treatment? When you have a treatment that might extend someone's life, um, but you're going to forego it. The most obvious ground is when the treatment itself is burdensome. So you're not saying that the life is a burden and the treatment is to get the life out of the way, but you're saying that the treatment itself is burdensome. Um, and even though it might extend the life, uh, we're going to forgo a burdensome treatment. Now, whether that deals with every situation where we ought to not, where we ought to forgo treatment, um, is a difficult question. Um, and I think the puzzling one, we can try to sort it out. But I think it's ultimately a question that's going to have to be faced existentially at the bedside by devoted family members and clinicians. And I think that's about the best that we can do. I'm Laura Satter from Davidson College. And with your critique of living wills, but also your mention that of the need to discuss issues of death and decline in modern society, while the living wills themselves might be overrated in the popular media, they seem to provide one of the only uh, sources of discussion simulating about, or one of the only sources simulating discussion about death and debilitation in the public. And I was wondering if you thought that although the actual pieces of paper may not be helpful, if that discussion, even with Terry Shiva, where people might not have created living wills, that they would still talk about them and talk about issues related to that, if they're valuable from that aspect, and if you don't think so, what, how you think you should, this topic should be approached? to create public awareness? That's another very good question. I think that is the best case for living wells. The data on whether this is actually happening is very mixed. I mean, there's lots of social science. Um, people like Rebecca Dresser um, at Washington University, Carl Schneider at the University of Michigan are really people that have studied the social science question and try to show that on a practical level, living wells aren't meeting the goals that they're trying to meet, um, including some of the data suggests the goal of trying to profit very that you have. If living wills do that and prompt a kind of genuine conversation between spouse and spouse or parent and child about uh, the dilemmas ahead, then I, I'm all for it. Um, I'm just skeptical that they're doing that. And I think there's a better kind of instrument. Um, as opposed to a living will, I would support uh, a durable power of attorney. Right? A living will aims to give precise instructions about how you should be cared for some future self um, and conditions and ability that it's frankly impossible to imagine. Um, no one can imagine every concrete circumstance of their situation um, years or even months in advance. The proxy of kind of the durable power of a durable power of attorney or so-called proxy directive empowers some trusted loved one to care for you in your days of decline. And I think that is a much wiser instrument precisely because it confronts in the deepest way the reality of interdependence. I mean living will at its worst tries to extend autonomy in a period of life when autonomy is gone. And the durable power of attorney, limited as all legal and procedural instruments are, at least kinds of tries to welcome and acknowledge uh, and invite the kind of conversation that you're talking about between family members, between patients and doctors about what the best care is. So um, it's a very good question. And, uh, I don't mean to have problems with living wills, uh, but I do think there are situations where they can work, and they work best when they, they awaken the very kind of conversation I'm Bo from the University of Pennsylvania. And my question is, when there was a topic of you know, your discussion in the moment of old age, it seems that when you're talking about the cycle of death, that death is not really restricted to old age. So 
Well, I was wondering if, I mean, how applicable is this to, you know, younger people who are terminally ill, while some people argue that it's a natural, natural course of life that they're taking that, um, such as like cancer at a younger age, and this natural course, would you expect these people at such a young age to also, you know, acknowledge that, to confront death in the same way that um, these, the older people are? I'd say some of what I've been trying to explore is applicable to those other kinds of caregiving situations, where someone like a Terry Shapo um, gets, you know, afflicted with this horrible uh, disease, horrible uh, disability, rather, in the kind of prime of her life, and then is then in the care of her spouse, but also in a certain sense in the care of her parents. Um, the themes of equality, the themes of equal worth and dignity of human life, human life that is lost in kinds of vital powers. I think that is applicable throughout uh, the life, uh, from the very early stages to the very end. But I think the aging question is different, precisely because it has to do with the relationship between the generations and what it means to be a child caring for a parent. Um, and I think it's also the great sociological question of our day. I mean, the fact is there aren't that many people thankfully, that suffer the kind of things that, that Terry Shiloh has suffers. And there, there are far too many people horribly, you know, the young who are suffering debilitating diseases and the need of care and the need to face death in the way that you described. But the mass phenomenon that we need to confront sociologically, politically, and ethically is the aging society, and I think that raises its own kind of questions, um, especially in the case of this dementia and extended Alzheimer's disease, where the burdens of care are not going to be a few months or a few months years, but potentially many, many years. Um, so uh, the equality theme, which I think is crucial to think about these questions, I think does translate. The life cycle theme, I think, is its own kind of, uh, it's its own kind of human question, and, and human reality, I think, is different. When you're talking about Hi, I'm Jennifer Miller from Trinity International University. Um, I really agree with you that a lot of times it is very ethical to not continue treatment um, when it seems futile, but I also believe that it's important to uphold patient autonomy. So I think that the duty of the physician is to inform the patient of treatments that are available to them and to tell them about the risks and the burdens, but then to let the patient decide. Um, so my question is when the physician believes that the tr further treatment would be futile um, and not very beneficial. However, the patient has a strong interest to push on and do all means necessary. What is the physician's role then? Do they need to uphold the patient's wishes still? Well, here I think is the problem with the argument. I'm not quite sympathetic to it, but the, 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 the patients and human beings that I'm talking about here are patients who have lost their autonomy. And they're people who are suffering from afflictions like Alzheimer's disease, and who necessarily have to rely on others to speak on their behalf. And so you can't sit with them and have a rational conversation about risks and benefits, and then just leave it up to them. Mm -hmm. Secondly, frankly, our four maternalistic doctors, you know, everybody's against maternalism, or maternalism, whatever you want to call it, but um, a good physician will often tell you what to do, because oftentimes families are in situations of crisis. They're in situations where they need guidance. They're in situations where they can't the little perfect rational actors that the economists dream up in their game theories. And they need to get the guidance of a wise and devoted clinician who will see them through to the end of their disease and who has seen these kinds of predictions before and who knows what the situation demands. And I'm not saying that doc, doc, look, there's bad paternalism and there are all kinds of doctors who are arrogant, foolish, and simply, I don't think that's the majority of them, but they certainly exist. And there was certainly a kind of attitude of paternalism that may not have served us well in the years past. But I think this kind of cult of autonomy and this cult of anti-paternalism has been a vast overcorrection of all the problems. And so I'm going to give two and a half years for paternalism. Okay, and then where would you draw the line between a, doctor rec a doctor's recommendations and then telling them what they should do? I don't know. I mean, look, a, a, a wise doctor also knows how to talk to how to, to engage in conversation with the caregivers on behalf of patients who can't speak for themselves. And, but, uh, 
turn the doctor into some kind of you know, nauseous, nauseous person, quite the opposite. But you don't want, at least in the throes of a kind of crisis where you're facing a new kind of situation, where you're facing the care of someone you love and you just don't know what to do, you don't even know what love demands anymore. Um, I'm not sure what you want as a doctor to say, well, you can do this and this will happen, you can do that and this will happen. Um, here's the best data we have on all these different things, and just let me know what you want to do, and I'm here for you. But doctors are not lawyers. Uh, I love lawyers. I love lawyers. <laughs> um, but they're not simply, maybe they are more like lawyers, maybe they are the same. I don't know, we have to think this through. But they're not simply there to represent and do the bidding of the patient as the patient chooses. They also have a kind of ethic of their own, and they sometimes need to guide patients and caregivers to the right kind of care. Um, that said, in lots of situations, there isn't one right kind of care. I mean, lots of situations are genuinely ambiguous and genuinely require a kind of family choice. And in those situations, the doctors need to be wise guides and stewards. But um, I just thought I'd put in a plug for journalism. I thought Dr. Paul McHugh would appreciate that. Yeah. So uh, anything that I can do to make my uh, my uh, my dear friend and teacher Paul McHugh happy, I'm happy. Uh, my name is Julia Halsey. I'm from Georgia State University in Missouri, um, and I was just wondering where hospice um, and those type of things that you know encourage or that's not encourage but allow families and dying individuals you know to do that at home and kind of you know take care of not only the medical needs, but also social and um, emotional, and like working through all that dying process, as opposed to just, you know, uh, I guess more um, expeditious um, types of allowing a patient to die, such as, you know, just allowing pneumonia to take its course or something like that. Uh, it's, a, it's a long question, let me give a few thoughts. I should say before I do, I'm not an expert on hospice care. It. Um, and my basic intuition is to be sympathetic, um, that a lot of people who are engaged in, in providing hospice care is a great blessing to the dying, not only the elderly who are dying, but often and often especially people who are dying, say, from terrible forms of cancer, where it's pretty clear where the path is going to be, where there's a kind of concrete amount of time, where comfort is all you can offer. Um, that's not a small thing. Um, and where uh, there's a kind of conscious awareness of the death that is coming and one can go for it. The only kind of caveats I'd offer to a sort of general sympathy for hospice is as a policy matter, I think sometimes it gets complicated, right? If you become eligible for hospice care and many people know you're doing much better than I, I know there are sometimes situations, or I think anyway, where going into hospice makes one ineligible for other kinds of care, at least on Medicare, um, that might be genuinely beneficial to the life of the patients to that. And so we need to constantly be aware of that. But I also think we need to be aware of, of the temptation to find a kind of technique for dying, you know, the 12 steps toward happy dying, you know. Um, I mean, there's certainly some wisdom in this, and I don't mean to belittle it. You know, I think of all these grief counselors who sort of arrive on the scene after tragedies, and no doubt they probably do most of the great good. But I, I have to say, a part of me is sort of aghast at this, and the notion that we're going to develop four-step techniques or eight-step techniques to kind of get through life's many trials, I'm not sure that that's uh, always the right way to go. I would welcome, frankly, a great involvement, and I know there is, um, but even more involvement of religious institutions and communities than black care. Uh, whatever your religious beliefs, partial, agnostic, not at all, orthodox, uh, the fact is, for a very large number of people, uh, religious devotion is the central organizing thing in their lives. And how we die can't be severed from how we live. I mean, you're not going to ignore death and then all of a sudden master some technique of dying. I mean, there's the kind of rhythms of life in all the religious traditions. Every week we service, death is never absent, um, you know, whether you're a Christian or Jewish or some other faith. Um, I can speak more honestly about Judaism and Christianity, obviously, but. Uh, Death is always present in the rhythm of weekly worship. Um, and I think that presence will matter in the end. Um, and I think as much uh, more meaningful, perhaps, than those that aim to make dying into a kind of technique. But with those kinds of caveats, 
Um, I'm generally sympathetic to hospital care, but I obviously defer to people who are much wiser about how it's worked, whether it's served or not. Sorry, I'm Eric from Michigan State University. Um, I have a quick question. Centuries ago, people died literally in the house. Before hospitals were there, people were dying you know, upstairs, and you saw that face of death firsthand. So I think we've kind of gone away from seeing death firsthand, so we kind of have a fear of death. I was just wondering, of the people in this room, who wants to die in a hospital? I mean, how many people think that's necessarily more humane or what they would like for themselves? And I wonder if, when you get to that point, and you say, you know, you, you no longer have the choice of where you are, you're letting others choose for you. Um, if the way we handle that currently by, you know, through hospitals or through other medical organizations is necessarily the best humane way of handling the end of life. Yeah, that's a, that's a very welcome, uh, difficult question. From the, from the data that I've seen, everybody wants to die at home, but everybody dies at hospital. Or most of them, slightly less exaggerated, most people want to die at home. The majority of people die in either hospitals or institutions. Now, why that is is a kind of puzzling question. Um, but I think the reason is people die in hospitals because they're not yet think they're going to die. Uh, they're not, uh, there's some hope of, of extending life a little bit longer. Um, and hospitals are not generally institutions that are equipped for dying, they're equipped for fighting them. Um, and, uh, but it's precisely because of our attitude of trying to oppose death, which is basically one to be praised, um, but can also bring some kind of perversions, um, that we end up dying in hospitals. Um, how to get beyond that, I just I don't know. Um, precisely because there might always be something else you can try, or there might always be some other kind of expert uh, intervention that is be better delivered in a hospital rather than at home. People say they want to die at home, but, but they ought to end up in institutions. And maybe we can change the way things look to change that reality, but I don't know how. But you do invite us to meditate on a kind of deep matter, which is death in our society is treated largely as a medical phenomenon. Um, and surely medicine has something and birth in its essence, for nearly everyone is born in hospitals. Uh, and that's uh, probably a great thing. Uh, so I just had a, a three-month-old daughter, I'm just happy to have all these machines like that. Um, so, um, but, but birth and death are not fundamentally in the deepest sense. I 